This episode is brought to you by Gnosis. Gnosis builds decentralized infrastructure for the Ethereum ecosystem. With a rich history dating back to 2015 and products like Safe, CowSwap, or Gnosis Chain, Gnosis combines needs-driven development with deep technical expertise. This year marks the launch of Gnosis Pay, the world's first decentralized payment network. With the Gnosis card, you can spend self-custody crypto at any Visa accepting merchant around the world. If you're an individual looking to live more on chain or a business looking to white label the stack, visit GnosisPay.com. There are lots of ways you can join the Gnosis journey. Drop in the Gnosis DAO governance form, become a Gnosis validator with a single GNO token and low cost hardware, or deploy your product on the EVM compatible and highly decentralized Gnosis chain. Get started today at Gnosis.io. Cars One is one of the biggest node operators globally and help you stake your tokens on 45 plus networks like Ethereum, Cosmos, Celestia and DYDX. More than 100,000 delegators stake with Chorus One, including institutions like BitGo and Ledger. Staking with Chorus One not only gets you the highest yields, but also the most robust security practices and infrastructure that are usually exclusive for institutions. You can stake directly to Chorus One's public node from your wallet, set up a white label node, or use the recently launched product, Opus, to stake up to 8,000 ETH in a single transaction. You can even offer high yield staking to your own customers using their API. Your assets always remain in your custody so you can have complete peace of mind. Start staking today at chorus.one. Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Brian Crane and I'm here with my co host Felix Luch. And today we're going to speak with Izzy Pazadis. He is the master of validators, great title, uh, at Lido, Lido DAO. Of course, Lido a project probably pretty much everyone listening here is familiar with. The, the most successful liquid staking protocol in total and most successful liquid staking protocol on Ethereum. Definitely one of the biggest things in staking. Uh, and you're doing a lot of interesting stuff. And yeah, I'm really excited to uh, to talk with Izzy about that. Okay, cool. Well, thanks so much for coming on, Izzy. It's really great. Uh, really excited to speak with you. Uh, of course, Lido is something uh, I think both Felix and I have been you know, deeply involved in since the very beginning. And it's been a you know very impactful project for crypto. So I'm really excited to talk with you and talk about Lido. But maybe just to start off, tell us a little bit about your background. Like, how did you get into crypto and how did that end up with you uh, working on Lido? Yeah, definitely. So th first of all, thanks for having me. Uh, pleasure to be on here. I, I know that Constantine and Vasily have also previously done episodes and they spoke really highly of their experience here. So um, I'm, I'm glad to be included. Um, so how did I, like, what's my origin story? Um, so my background is very, very non-crypto, very kind of like traditional, uh, corporate. Um, so I studied econ and international relations. Uh, and then I ended up at a big four firm for approximately six, six and a half years. Uh, and then uh, as we say in that industry, I rotated into the industry. So I was working at, um, some large retail companies doing like finance and risk management. Um, and most recently, uh, approximately five years ago, I, I was working at Nike, uh, at the European headquarters doing financial controls and risk management, um, kind of like building up the, the European processes there. And at that time, like COVID hit, uh, and I had a lot of free time and I was trying to find something that interested me a little bit more in terms of like where I'd be allocating my time. Um, I'd been involved in crypto since around 2016. And by that, I mean like losing money, trying to trade. Um, and I started reading more about crypto, like all of the basic mechanisms. And it was like, um, a couple months earlier, I think had just been the uh, genesis of the beacon chain. Uh, so I was reading a lot about staking, a lot about like game theory and MEV. Uh, so I was like writing some, I don't want to know if you want to call them like articles, like posts around the time around the possible centralizing effects of MEV on validator sets and what staking solutions and staking protocols in, do, in general could do to stave off like the, the centralization effects there. And especially 
worded about how centralized um, exchanges primarily, but centralized staking solutions in general would use things like user lifetime value to be able to like offset costs of staking um, to capture users and, and centralize the markets even further. Uh, and somehow one of these articles uh, ended up in the hands of uh, Vasily, I think. Um, and around the time, even like Felix was, was the, involved in this process, I think they, they gave me a Lego grant to be like, hey, this article is pretty cool. Uh, do you want to come write another one for, for Lido, uh, looking at these problems specifically through the prism of Lido and what Lido as, as a DAO and as a protocol can do to kind of alleviate some of these pernicious effects of, of like staking in general and economies of scale and MEV. Uh, and like a month after I started writing the second iteration of the article, I just get a DM. Um, actually, at, at the recent Lido Connect, I, I found this DM and I put it on the screen because it looks like a scam. It basically says like in half broken English, hey, do you still want a job in crypto? Um, and and that's, that's how I ended up at Lido. So I, I started the job part time, I think in August of 21. Uh, working at both uh, Nike and as a contributor to the Lido DAO. And then I realized that that wasn't viable or sustainable. Um, and so I decided to to try it full time and see how it would work. And it's been two and a half years since then. It's it's really, really awesome ride and really, really crazy. What, what was it about Lido that you found so exciting? Um, I think it was like, three three kind of intersecting concepts which also have a lot to do with with the principles behind lido and, and the value so the one was the like very matter of fact and pragmatic approach which um the the founders and the first people working on on the protocol kind of took into designing mechanisms um and the really apt i i guess at that point maybe you could call it a guess or or um a, an inkling that they had about what the market would look like in, in one to two years, right? And positioning themselves in such a way uh, based on these assumptions to stave off the centralized players, which like, if you look at, I think, staking distribution in early 2021, it was something like over 50 or 60% was with centralized staking providers uh, in aggregate. And, and how to basically move the stake share away from centralized staking providers and move it towards decentralized protocols now, obviously, there's like a huge debate um, with regards to like what constitutes decentralized. And, you know, you have this whole spectrum between um, per permissionlessness at the staker level and at the node operator level. And we can get to that in, in more details later. Um, but at least starting with a solution which is practical uh, and usable at a mass scale in the beginning in order to stave off decentralizing effects. Um, and then really, really do the work in terms of like being leaders and researchers in decentralizing the protocol, like Lido itself, um, but also the effects that it has on the network as much as possible throughout uh, the further growth of the protocol. And I found that really appealing uh, because I believe that in general, as we see more adoption of, of crypto and blockchain, you're going to have to find this meeting point between ideology and kind of like the, the virtues and, and the values of, of the chain and around like the people that started the chain and where it meets kind of like the practical reality of market forces and trying to find the right balance between uh, those two things. And I think Lido does a really, really great job of that. All right. So you mentioned, right, like the, the main kind of danger of, of Lido not being there is the centralized exchanges now in recent months, especially since Lido sort of broke this 33% threshold of like market share in staking Ethereum, actually like Lido has been getting much more of the sort of hate, let's say, <laughs> or like sort of backlash from the Ethereum community around like the centralizing effects of Lido. Now, I think what we sort of wanted to talk about, since that's like kind of also your role in in Lido is, you know, what, what Lido is doing to um, actually be decentralized. So sort of highlighting, you know, where are the centralizing vectors and what what's actually like sort of the the things Lido does um, to to decentralize? So maybe yeah, can you go into some of these points? I think the the first one would be probably like your your actual job at uh, in terms of like node operator selection. So maybe we can kind of start there. Can you tell us a little bit how that works, just so guests have a overview? Yeah, definitely. And I'll take maybe just like one really quick step back um, to set the context a little bit around like. What, what do we mean when we say Lido? Because Lido means a lot of different things. So I'll, I'll try to be a little bit more specific as, as I use 
or as I mentioned, uh, th these different aspects of, of Lido uh, in the rest of the cast. So Lido is um, at its core, a set of smart contracts. So basically like software scripts, if you want to think about it, right? That reside on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, and this software is essentially a middleware that helps to aggregate and allocate stake across a variety of different node operators. And the the kind of like counterbalance to this action is this creation of a liquid staking token, um, which represents this staked ether and the the rewards that it accrues. The other facet of Lido is the DAO. So the DAO is uh, an organization, and Lido is probably one of like the fewer the few like what I call pure play DAOs. Like there's no legal entity um, that wraps the Lido DAO. And the, the DAO essentially is a guardian of the protocol, let's say, uh, for now. And there's a lot of work being done in order to determine and understand how can we reduce this guardianship over the protocol and eventually at some point uh, minimize it and maybe even remove it completely. Um, and so like, why does a protocol need a guardian? A protocol needs a guardian because at least currently, Ethereum is still changing. So in order for the protocol to change, to meet the base layer as it's improving and upgrading and evolving, like adding new functionality. For example, withdrawals were only added to Ethereum uh, in in the last hard fork, um, you know, in, in May of the, of yeah of, of this year. And if the protocol was ownerless and non-upgradable in the beginning, it wouldn't have been able to have withdrawals added. You can make an argument that you can perhaps like migrate the protocol from one version to another, but from a usability perspective, that's really really terrible. And to be honest, it's unsustainable given the amount of evolution that Ethereum is still going to make from a from a staking base layer perspective. Um, and the other reason that you need a kind of guardian is to, for the moment, control like a couple of the levers um, that protocols need while they're in this nascent stage. Uh, and these levers can be a bunch of different things. There might be things like curating a node operator set in the beginning, right? So how do you create a, a, a robust um, allocation protocol, you need to find node operators. One way to find node operators is by having a permissionless mechanism for any to, anybody to become a node operator, which Rocket Pool did very, very well um, from its inception, but it, it took Rocket Pool like a little bit over a year, I would say, like from when it in, intended to launch until when it actually launched in order to be able to deliver on this, on this promise. And so Lido wanted to launch as early as possible. So the concession that you needed to make there is that you needed a curated operator set. So you needed some sort of mechanism, uh, and this mechanism is DAO controlled, which means it's it's controlled by the LDO holders to select these node operators, to review them, and to figure out um, like if they're any good at their job. So my role within the DAO uh, as master of validators, I basically lead a team of contributors um, in a, a team or a workstream that we call node operator mechanisms. And the point of this work stream is to kind of act as a liaison in between the DAO and the node operators. Um, it takes how the protocol works and translates it into like mechanisms and processes and incentive alignment mechanisms to A, identify node operators that would work well with the protocol, to B, determine um, and make suggestions to the DAO as to how to allocate stake between these node operators, and then C, to figure out like strategies about how do we improve this this node operator set in the future. So Lido started with one module, which we call the curated operator module, which you guys also know because you were one of the the founding like like node operators, right, within the set uh, from from the chorus one perspective. Um, and so so like the remit for the first couple of years was grow the node operator set. So it grew from five initial node operators to currently um, thirty seven, and the next remit was to evolve the LIDAR protocol so that it's not only limited to one set of node operators. So in the V2 upgrade that came out in, in May, right after the Chappelle upgrade, um, the our core architecture of the protocol was, was changed. And from like a single module, it turned into kind of like a hub and spoke model where each new module that, we, that the DAO adds um, essentially avails the protocol of a new set of node operators and validators that could be permissioned or permissionless um, using DVT or not using DVT or using some other technology. Um, and it, it essentially turns Lido, um, well, n not yet, but it will eventually turn Lido into not only like a staking aggregator and allocator, but also a marketplace between all of these different node operator sets. Right. So yeah, I think there's like a lot to talk about there with the staking router and the modules. I think also like more recently, 
you already like announced two of the newer or like two of the newer mod modules were uh, kind of presented. So um, can you maybe like explain them a bit and why like these were the first two to to uh, come out? Yeah, absolutely. So as I mentioned earlier, the, the current module is the curated operator registry. It has 100% of the current stake allocated to LIDO. So all of the stake that's currently in, in LIDO, which is like around 32% of, of all of Ethereum stake right now is allocated across these 37 node operators. Um, the idea behind the two uh, modules that were first developed was the following. It was, A, how do we grow the node operator set as fast as possible by introducing as many new independent node operators as possible? And two, how do we deliver um, on an intent that was always there from the beginning, which was introduce a permissionless element to becoming a node operator on the LIDAR protocol. Uh, so both of the, the first modules that have been um, kind of discussed about and proposed to the DAO, so one of them, simple DVT, which I'll go into a little bit of detail on, uh, was approved by the DAO already. And the second one, which is called the community staking module, which is basically a permissionless uh, module geared towards, primarily geared towards solo stakers, but really anybody can use it. Um, is currently being voted on right now. So if you're curious about that, you can go to the LIDO forums um, or the LIDO snapshot and check out the proposal around the LIDO community staking module, uh, the CSM. So the CSM and Simple DVT work quite differently. Simple DVT leverages the existing technical shell, let's say of the curated operator registry. So from a technical perspective, it works exactly the same. The great thing about that is that you can just reuse the code. Uh, how it works very differently is the actual opera operationalization of the, the atomic level in the node operator registry, which is like in the curated module, it, it's a node operator, but in simple DVD, it's actually a cluster. So clusters are sets of node operators or groups that work together to run validators in tandem. Um, so whereas before validator duties are all uh, basically operated by one node operator with technologies like distributed validator technology of which um, Obel network and SSV network are the two that are currently being utilized in the simple DVT testnet. You can have validators run by multiple operators at the same time. This gives you increased operational robustness, um, reduced technical risk, and also reduced kind of like geographic and, and jurisdictional risk all at the same time. What it does add is a little bit of overhead off chain from a coordination perspective. So like you need to get all of these operators together. You need to basically battle harden the DVT technologies, which are still quite new and, and, and nascent, but the idea is that by utilizing the LIDAR protocol, we can actually ha run hundreds of these validators on mainnet, hopefully within the end of Q224. Um, and that'll really give us the, the, the opportunity to push these technologies and, and see how well they work um, from a practical perspective. Maybe it's worth if you just give like a two minute uh, summary of like what DVT is, because I don't think this is like something that everyone is going to be familiar with. Definitely. So DVT stands for Distributed Validator Technology. Um, and so normally like a validator is somebody running the server and the software um, by themselves. Uh, but in this case, you, Felix and I, uh, and ideally one more person, you, you kind of want like a threshold configuration. Um, and so they tend to be like three out of four or five out of seven or, or seven out of 10, um, where we can co-run a validator. So the private key itself is actually split amongst the three of us. And you need some sort of consensus between um, that M of N that we were talking about, like three of four or five of seven, to put enough of those key shares together to, to make a full key. Uh, likewise, in terms of operating a validator, you need that consensus threshold when performing validator activities, like attesting or proposing blocks or participating on sync committees in order to, to actually send like a valid message to, to the network. So when you, when you split the share, uh, the one thing that you really, really drastically reduce is like the risk of this key somehow being compromised. Um, instead of it only being compromised in one place, it now needs to be comp compromised in, in multiple places. So the, the risk of key theft or, or key loss is drastically reduced. Because of the threshold mechanism, uh, it also means that some portion of this group of operators that's co-running a validator can actually be offline and the validator itself keeps running. So you really offset also operational and a technical risk that is associated with, with running validators. Um, and the other thing that you can do is also like even one operator, for example, might choose to use DVT 
if they want to distribute distribute the technical risk of, of running a validator, right? So they might want to split one key um, across multiple nodes that they might be running in different geographies or different jurisdictions, or even using different clients. Um, because in Ethereum, like client diversity is also really, really important. So if you're splitting your key across multiple nodes that run different clients, uh, you reduce the risk of, of client bugs affecting your, your validator activities. Maybe, can you talk a little bit about uh, the governance aspect as well? I know there's like dual governance, which has been a big, uh, a big thing that's been explored by Lido. Can you explain like what dual governance is and like what you're trying to address with dual governance? Yeah, absolutely. So dual governance at its core um, is an attempt to solve what is well known as the principal agent problem. Um, and it's basically the conundrum of what happens when the people who get to decide about something do not have aligned uh, expectations, preferences, or ideal outcomes with the people whose de decisions they affect. Um, in DeFi protocols, that's basically when governance token holders, so for, in Lighter's case, LDO holders, do may not necessarily have the same desired outcome um, as stakers, STE holders. Uh, in Lido's case, there's actually like quite a large overlap between these two segments of users or, or audiences, let's say. But there is a big discrepancy in terms of um, the the power equality, let's say, between them, right? So you might have a lot of stakers that might also have a lot of a little bit of LDO, but obviously they're largely affected um, to the extent that STETH is a portion of their portfolio, like by larger token holders. So what dual governance allows you to do is have the second set of, uh, or the second subset of users, let's say, so SDE holders, have a say in the governance proceedings around uh, Lido DAO controlling the protocol and then therefore stakers. Um, its purpose within Lido is kind of like twofold. One is to more closely align the incentives between these two groups. So like the mechanism existing in the first place is kind of like a, a deterrent for one group doing something that the other group doesn't want just just by itself. And the other thing is to make sure that if, for example, there's something that goes wrong with the governance mechanism, like um, somebody ends up holding a lot of LDO and their desires are not in line with what's good for stakers or other LDO holders, then STE holders can basically veto votes that they think are not, are not good for them or might be bad for the network. So this allows stakers to more directly represent their interests by not having to have exposure to the LDO token. Um, and the other kind of benefit here is that if they disagree with like votes that LDO holders might be having, um, to give them time to exit the protocol, right? So at, at its core, dual governance is like a foot voting mechanism, which means that like you take your money and you move it elsewhere. So you have to give these stakers enough time to be able to take that money and move elsewhere if they disagree with with the direction of a vote or, or the effect of a vote. Um, and this basically does that by putting the the protocol in, in kind of like a, a limbo state. So if LDO holders like get captured or um, by somebody that has like malicious intents for the protocols, right? Like wants to upgrade it to do something that's bad for stakers. Stakers can basically put the, uh, the protocol into this limbo state um, and then it allows for more stakers to come in to decide if they are actually against this vote or not. And if they are, they can put the protocol um, into a mode that's called like local settlement, which is basically all stakers who are voting, vetoing uh, the current proposals will be allowed to withdraw their stake. Uh, and so that also reduces the actual power that the, the lighter protocol would have on the network. So this is one way for stakers not only to protect themselves, but also to protect the underlying network. Would this also allow people who have staked ETH that's locked up in some kind of DeFi protocol to participate or, or you will need to have the staked ETH kind of, you know, just like liquid in a wallet? So that's kind of like a implementation detail that's that's not ired out. Actually, if um, I don't know if we can attach links later, but there is like an ongoing discussion on the forums about stuff exactly like that. I think in its current iteration, it would be very, very difficult um, to have SDE that is used in DFI protocols to actually be used to veto. Because basically you would need to create like a wrapped version of it for every DeFi protocol that supports SDE. And then you also have to deal with like, what if it's bridged to other like L2s or even other L1s. Um, but what 
uh, in lieu of that, the current mechanism is the following. There's kind of like multiple veto thresholds. The first veto threshold is, is quite low. So if you get um, some small amount of STE stakers, and like I, I don't recall what the threshold is right now, but I think it's like be below mm, like 5%, they can extend the window during which more SDE stakers have time to come in and veto the proposal. So basically, like if all three of us agree that, hey, this proposal is a bad idea, but you two guys are defined, you need 20 days to exit, but my STE is, is in my wallet, I can go and veto the proposal. And that gives you guys enough time to pull your STE out of DeFi and then come and also put it into, into the veto uh, aggregation mechanism. Yeah, so we're talking a lot about like STE in DeFi. I think, yeah, one, one thing that we wanted to also, you know, uh, hear more about is, yeah, how like SDE is pretty huge, right? It's like 20 billion market cap. And like, obviously one of the core promises of liquid staking is sort of you can utilize your collateral in DeFi now. Um, yeah, we wanted to ask sort of around, you know, how is it being, how is ETH currently used? And, you know, how do you see the usage evolve in the future? Like, So there's kind of like an interesting dynamic that we've observed together with um, like the, the timings of the actual market, right? Like if, if we're in a bull or a, or a bear market. In general, in, in bull markets, you, you tend to see people are more, let me say adventurous, I guess, with their SDETH um, and, and in bear markets, less so. Uh, however, actually, we see more uh, SDETH like plain holders than than we were initially expecting. Um, that said, though, SDETH is basically like one of the biggest drivers of most DeFi protocols right now. So if you look at like Aave uh, or, or, or Maker and you look at like the vault utilization rates or, or um, the amount of capital that has been provided uh, in terms of like lending, uh, STETH is up there with ETH and in some cases surpassing it. Um, and that also kind of makes sense from an economic perspective because at some point the the rates between these two tokens, like the the lending rates, especially because some people will lend STETH to borrow ETH to restake it, uh, kind of find an equilibrium, right? So at some point it doesn't make sense to necessarily go and lend out all of your STETH um, because the rates that you get on it are, are either not worth the additional risk that you might be taking on it from a, a smart contract or from a protocol perspective, or just because you prefer the immediate liquidity as opposed to having to unwind all of those positions. So do you know, what, what, so what's the percentage right now that is being used in DeFi and like what are kind of the top uh, usage pattern that you're seeing? So I think that the current usage is somewhere between 35 to 45% of SDETH in, in DeFi. Um, but actually, that's probably like a, a couple of months old since that's the last time I, I saw it. However, um, the other real difficulty here is like tracking this across L2s and then also tracking it across L1s. Uh, so a lot of the times what we see is that there's like STETH and it's on a bridging contract. Um, and it's difficult then to like kind of like pierce the veil and go into like Solana, right? And see exactly how it's used on Solana or um, even on Osmosis and, and Neutron now since the recent uh, bridging kind of capabilities there. Um, so the most common usage is actually in, from a lending perspective. Leverage staking, um, it's, it's kind of like restaking if you think about it, like you're, you're taking out ETH and then restaking it, but you're restaking means something different now. But leverage staking um, was and, and still is like the largest use case of it. But we actually also see a lot of people that are uh, lending their STETH and borrowing stables against it. Uh, and this is beneficial because you kind of have the built-in rewards rate of STETH while you're lending it as well as a quite beneficial uh, lending rate that's offsetting the, the, the borrow rate that you have to pay on, on the stables. So in bear markets, when there's like a lot of volatility, it's a little bit more dangerous. It means users have to be much more caref careful about the health factors of their vaults. Um, but in the last couple of months, when the markets have been like relatively more stable, um, you see a lot more of this kind of usage. And it makes sense uh, because stables are generally like the easiest way to get exposure to other secondary or, or tertiary tokens, especially if you want to easily hop across different networks because they're, they're, it's, it's, there's a lot of liquidity there. Um, but also in terms of being able to take these stables and then go to centralized exchanges where you might want more like exotic options like uh, perps and stuff like that. Yeah, while we're talking about bridging and you know bringing STETH to different networks, 
I, I think that's also like been a, a huge topic in recent weeks and months, right? So you mentioned already Utron and, and some other ones that uh, SD is available. Now, uh, can you talk a little bit about how it works? And I guess most importantly, probably like explain to us a little bit the scenario that, that happened with like layer zero and like how wrapped SDE was supposed to be brought to BNB from them, but it wasn't like going through the governance process. So I think there has been like a bunch of discussion how, you know, uh, SDE can be bridged uh, across to other ecosystems. And yeah, maybe you can just kind of shine some light on, on this whole like story and, and you know, how, how SDE will be bridged going forward. And, and the role of the Lido DAO in it. I'll, I'll do my best here because this isn't really my, my area, but I, I can give you guys kind of like a, my understanding and also from a, a general process perspective. Um, so the tricky thing about bridging and like in general with, with DeFi tokens is that they're permissionless in terms of how they're used, right? So technically anybody can take uh, STETH, wrap it and bridge it if they want to. The question is, um, how do you kind of like focus the activity so that you don't fragment liquidity too much? Because if there's like five different bridge versions of a token uh, on the destination, whatever, chain, L2, uh, even maybe L3 at some point, um, you really, really decrease the usability of the token itself from a user perspective. Uh, so you, you want to take an approach that is like coordinated from the perspective of providing the best possible liquidity and experience to a user. Um, the way that Lido DAO contributors and, and the Lido DAO itself in terms of like the things that it's ratified uh, have put together a process around this is that there's a team of contributors um, that's called, it's dubbed new network expansion working group or work group, I think uh, is what it stands for. And basically they're there kind of like uh, node operator mechanisms is from a node operator perspective to coordinate the efforts between um, host and target chains, but also the actual bridging protocols themselves around A, making sure that kind of like the right process is followed and the right process basically means, hey, are we sure that this is like the best user experience for the user uh, on the target chain? B, um, is kind of like, are like the risks around the bridging mechanism the, the minimum that they could be? Or are there improvements that could be made or other bridging mechanisms that might make more sense? Uh, see what is the interplay between the token uh, that ends up on the network and like the DeFi protocols that exist on 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 the target chain because you want something that is immediately usable uh, by what the DeFi environment is is on that side. You don't want to like end up creating a token that then needs to be rewrapped into another token because again you face um, liquidity fragmentation. And then D is is there a way to take a consistent approach with as many of these bridges as possible? Uh, and that's why if, if you look at the the layer zero post. Um, and the kind of like governance kerfuffle, I guess, let's say that happened um, when that was posted is that there was kind of a, a set strategy, especially with regards to layer two deployments um, in the sense that like native or canonical bridges should be used whenever possible. Uh, but in this case, this was kind of um, an alternative to that uh, that hadn't necessarily been uh, reviewed by the, the new team yet. So w one thing we also wanted to talk about here is, you know, Ethereum is still there's a, in a lot of evolution, right? And there are a lot of, uh, I mean, it, it evolves kind of slowly in some way, but there's a lot of thinking always, right, from Ethereum researchers around, you know, protocol changes and things they want to, ways they want to evolve Ethereum. And of course, some of those also uh, affect Lido. So I'm curious uh, about you thinking on that. Like, w what do you feel are the most important uh, things on the Ethereum roadmap that are coming in the future and how do you see them affecting Lido? Yeah, that's a great question. So ho hopefully um, sometime in the, the next hard fork, which I'm trying to remember like the nickname for it now, I think it's Petra, uh, but basically uh, Prague Electra, um, the, the kind of discussion happening now is whether EIP 7002 will be included or not. That is the Ethereum improvement proposal around triggerable exits. Uh, and basically, right now, the only way to exit a validator uh, is by using the validator key on the consensus layer. Uh, and the, what this proposal would allow for is a way for uh, users and node operators to exit validators using the execution layer. So basically, sending a signal from the withdrawal credentials of a validator 
um, to the consensus layer to exit the validator. From a staking solution perspective, and this applies not only to liquid staking protocols, um, but like centralized staking solutions and even solo stakers, this is something really, really useful. Um, it means that if for some reason you lose the validator key, you have a way to exit the validator and recoup the, the capital uh, and pending rewards that are still on that validator. But it also means that protocols uh, that want to be decentralized and therefore should have permissionless ways for node operators to join the node operator set have a defense measure against node operators that go rogue or do something malicious um, or like even in the best of cases, you know, just go inactive for long periods of time. So like, let's say I'm a solo staker um, and, I and I join a, a permissionless liquid staking protocol, but something happens and like I'm offline for nine months. Should all of those penalties be socialized to all of the, the liquid staking token holders? Every protocol might, might approach this decision a little bit differently, but what this does allow is for the protocols to make, create like, let's say a rule around this and, and how protocols uh, protect themselves going forward. So at the same time, yes, it kind of changes the balance of power between the protocols and node operators because you no longer need node operators to like, let's say acquiesce uh, to a validator being exited. But that's why for Lido, something like dual governance is really, really important because you can shield those kinds of decisions. So for example, under which cases, like what are the rules and criteria under which validators exits may be triggered from the execution layer? Um, and also, even if you want to make the actual exits themselves objectionable, let's say by through the dual governance process, um, to limit the risk of that that functionality, that feature being abused by by a protocol or by a DAO. Um, and the other uh, EIP that's being discussed now that would have a very very large effect on uh, a lot of liquid staking protocols is the one around changing the maximum effective balance of a validator. So currently, all validators on Ethereum basically have a, a minimum. Uh, in order to be active and effective, which is 32 ETH, or to be activated. Uh, technically, you can be go below that number once the validator has been activated and, and still be active, um, and a maximum, which is, again, 32 ETH, which is why we have hundreds of thousands of validators on the network currently. And what that's doing is that it's congesting the peer-to-peer -peer network of, of Ethereum. Um, and although, in general, the network is performing all right right now, uh, people are afraid that if the number of validators doubles or eventually even triples, the network will either stop running well or perhaps not even run properly at all. Um, so I, there was a test net that was done a couple of months ago. Uh, and basically they tried to run Ethereum with, I think like 2 point something million validators or you know, sorry, like 1.7 million and it didn't run properly. A lot of improvements have been made to clients since then, but another way to do it is to increase the amount of stake that can actually be allocated to one validator. And that's what the max effective balance uh, EIP would allow you to do. So you could see large node operators. Um, so for example, the node operators that are in Lido's curated set or Coinbase and Kraken and, and other centralized uh, staking solutions, or even like large node operators for the validators that they sell to customers directly, obviously like Chorus One, begin to consolidate their validators. So instead of running like, let's say hundred validators of 32 ETH um, on a specific machine, uh, on a specific like validator client, you might just have 3,200 uh, worth of stake on a specific validator. Although I think currently the proposal is to go up to 2048, but like the, the general concept is, is the same. Um, so you reduce the amount of stress that's on the peer-to-peer -peer network, uh, and that gives you better like performance, which eventually potentially lays the groundwork for something like uh, single slot finality, which which needs block times to be like relatively performant. So in in that scenario. So, so maybe just expanding on a little bit on this. So here, the, I, I mean, I presume, right, the staking rewards would also scale proportionally with the amount of ETH in there. And and it, it, is it also the chance of being selected as a proposer would then also be like, let's say, if you have 320 ETH on a validator instead of 32, you'd also be like 10 times as likely to be selected for the different kinds of uh, roles, you know, that like kind of lead to, I mean, a proposer, I guess, mainly that leads to like, you know, additional rewards. Yeah, that that's correct. So basically the, the allocation mechanism for like, if you're selected to do something will be based on stake weight, as opposed to this idea that there's like a nominal value, which is just, you know, number of validators or one, right? If, it, if they're all 32, uh, with regards to the weight between 
how likely you are to be selected to do something. Although technically it has to do with the effect of balance, right? So not the maximum, um, but what the current effect of balance of, of the validator is. And the other interesting thing here from uh, potentially even from like a small stake or perspective is what this means from uh, compounding of rewards. So like, let's say that you're a solo staker and you only have 32 ETH, so you can only run one validator right now. Um, it's very difficult to then compound those rewards because anything above 32 ETH on a validator doesn't get rewards. So you have the partial rewards mechanism that allows you to take these rewards out and you can do something with them, potentially, you know, get a liquid staking token. Um, but it doesn't allow you to directly restake it if if you want to do it, like restake it, not not restaking in the Aguilera sense. So what what this max effective balance allows you to do is potentially start a validator with 32 ETH um, because the maximum balance isn't necessarily the balance required to activate the validator. It'll probably stay at 32. And then that means that the rewards can accumulate on that validator and you will compound your rewards until you reach, reach whatever the new max that you've selected. So it might be 64, it might be 128, um, it might be 2048, at which point the partial rewards mechanism will kick in again and everything will be skimmed off the top. I think another solution to this problem, right, is that that's been often discussed as sort of to like lower the staking rewards so that like less people participate in staking, which is, is that correct? Or like, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, this is pretty controversial, I, I guess, as, a, as an idea, even within the LidoDAO contributors. So I think in general, the idea of minimum viable issuance is correct, right? You do not ever want to overpay for something if you can afford not to. Um, but I think the, the biggest question here is like, what is, what are staking rewards actually paying for? And is the economic security from a technical perspective, as in like what the network needs to run, the only thing that matters, or are we minimizing the importance of a lot of other things when we only look at it through, through that prism? And, and to be honest, I, I think we do. So there's, there's a couple of, of, of things at play here and Part of them is is also like convention or, or history. If you set staking rewards to a certain number, to a certain extent, it doesn't really matter what that number is, but then you go and change it, you almost break a set of expectations that the users of the protocol have with the protocol itself. Um, now, you can argue, and I think it's a convincing argument that like th there's no actual set of expectations, it's, it's, it's code, if people agree to do something else with the code, and that's basically what a blockchain is, they're free to do so. And so those those expectations are, are null and void. Um, but expectations build culture and they also build community. So, and, and we can even see this kind of like with uh, the recent kind of proposal that happened in Cosmos, right? Uh, with the change to uh, staking rewards on, on Atom. So you, you, you risk a potentially having like a schism in the community and even like a fork where some people will go one way and, and some people will go another way. Um, and then you also basically risk having negative externalities, so negative effects as a result of this decision that maybe you don't account for. So if we reduce the issuance of, of Ethereum right now, I think what you effectively do is price out a lot of solo stakers. It will no longer make sense for you to run a validator at home because the amount of rewards that you get like is drastically reduced. And unfortunately, what matters for solo stakers is absolute rewards in fiat terms because that's what their their like costs are 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 basically framed as. Um, if eventually we we live in a world where like ETH is is the stable coin, right, <laughs> um, and that'd be great, then it matters less. Uh, but right now it's not the the difficulties that users transact in in like local fiat currency. They pay their taxes in local fiat currency, and so it needs to be economically appealing for them to to remain as stickers on the network. Um, and I don't think you achieve that by uh, minimizing issuance even further. The other thing that you do is you essentially trigger a uh, centralization race because the more you push um, issuance downwards, the more you compress margins. When you compress margins, you make node operators like compete even more on, well, margins, right? So they will do things to cut costs. This means centralizing the way that they run validators. Um, I think you will see probably a lot of node operators go out of business and then like a consolidation effect in terms of the overall landscape of how many node operators are out there, how diversified they are um, from an infrastructure and an operations perspective, 
and perhaps even from a geographic and jurisdictional perspective. So those are the, the kind of counterweights that one has to think about um, in terms of like, wh what is a minimum issuance uh, useful for? Is it only useful for economically protecting the technical aspect of the network? Or do you want to protect things like, you know, um, the cultural uh, aspects of it, uh, the, the inclusiveness of it in terms of allowing solo stickers to participate, um, and also the robustness of it from an infrastructure and diversity perspective? Yeah, I mean, it also seems like a very flawed, it, like if the goal is to reduce the number of validator, then this seems like a very flawed approach also because is that even going to work, right? Because if you do use, for example, liquid staking tokens like staked ETH as a sort of, you know, the money thing and the denominator that you use in DeFi, then, well, that's kind of attractive to do if you earn 4% and it's still kind of attractive if you earn 2%, right? So like, uh, it's not really like, I mean, it, I could totally imagine one does that one does that thing and it doesn't really drive down the number of violators in the long run yeah it, it if, if it doesn't drive them down in in absolute terms um i think it does definitely doesn't help the the concentration risk let's put it that way so if, if like one of the things you're trying to do is is minimize centralization or, or saturation within certain types of staking solutions or staking entities then i don't think mvi does that yeah, and I guess the big challenge too is, I mean, at least in Cosmos, right, you do have this governance process, right? So you can ask the Adam Rollers and okay, it ended up being like a close vote, but still, it's like a majority was like, okay, in favor of this. And so in the end, I think it's like people are okay with it and they can accept it, right? But only in the Ethereum case, right, you don't really have that kind of mechanism. And then in the end, and I think that's always been like one of the big, you know, criticism and challenges of, of this whole kind of Ethereum governance process that it's something that's very intransparent. I mean, it, it's been forums and it's in different places and, you know, a bunch of researchers and community members have all these discussions and, and maybe they think about what the community wants, but it's like really hard to gauge it. And then decision happens like that. And for most people, they will just sort of, they will not feel they have a say in this. Yeah, that's that's a really, really good point. And like, to be honest, I I like the Ethereum governance approach, even though I, I, I'm often uh, at odds with it, at, at least in my position, like as a as a Lido DAO contributor, because of like the the brunt of the criticism that uh, Lido receives as a protocol. Um, but I think there's like you make concessions when you choose that kind of governance mechanism. Um, when you have on chain governance, that's very like you're saying transparent and clear, and like it's obvious what the effects of what, what you do will be, um, and you give people the ability to uh, like accept that or not, then it's much easier to have those kinds of discussions and those kinds of votes. It's kind of like how, uh, you know, in Switzerland, you have the cantons that have direct referendums whenever they want, they want to do things that really, really impact the populaces, and they do it all the time because this mechanism exists. But in networks where the, the governance mechanism is a lot softer, it's a lot more nuanced, it's a lot more intricate, and to a certain extent, it's also less accessible by the people that it impacts, being like the users. And um, Mike Noder at the EF did this really, really great analysis where he's looking at uh, like the sets of users that participate on, on Ethereum, but blockchain in general, um, how they intersect and what kind of representation you want of these different sets um, from a usage and from a governance perspective. Um, it's, it's difficult to both like think about all of these things, but then also kind of figure out ways for people to express their their opinion um, about what they want to see in a way that is like visible to everybody. So it's kind of like what you said. So the the researchers that are thinking about these things and honestly doing a really really good, good job about thinking about them maybe don't see things from the prism of like a DeFi user or from um, like a solo staker or from uh, you know a, a large staking solution because that's kind of like outside their their current field of view. So I think protocols or, or communities basically like Lido um, have to take a bigger role in not necessarily like representing users because I don't think like, you know, Lido is like a union of users, but trying to think about like the economic impact of um, EIPs uh, and offer not necessarily deferring points of view, but at least like other points of view uh, about what the effects of these things might be, whether it's something that users want or not, um, and 
if it's something that is, is desirable in general from an end state from an Ethereum perspective. And we're seeing it also not only for staking, but also for a lot of other sectors. So obviously like Eigenlayer is doing this a lot from a restaking perspective. Um, but restaking is not only like about staking, it's also about incentive alignment between networks, like settlement layers, data availability layers, um, tokenomics, and if, if you want like sustainable flywheels or not, you're seeing it with DeFi protocols. Um, if you look at kind of like how Uniswap as a DAO has 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 evolved, like kind of like their user education strategy, if you want to put it that way. Um, and obviously uh, Aave as well. So as users take on a more important role on the network, like not only as as people that kind of like interact with a protocol, which is like a little bit indirect and and maybe not so not so serious, but like inhabitants of a protocol, like people that live there, right? Because um, like you might have most of your life savings on Ethereum. And so therefore what happens to it is actually of vital, vital importance to you. So you, you will see that users start to express these preferences the ways that they can. And those ways might be um, through the protocols that they choose to interact with versus um, participating directly in governance. And then you, you, you would say these protocols basically interact in the forums or like talk to the researchers. I guess that's kind of what's happening a bit more now is like, for example, you know, like Justin Drake also being at these Lido events, you were having like some panel with them. Is is this sort of the path that's happening now or could there maybe be, I guess, some evolution of this with a bit more direct representation or is, is this something that, yeah, I don't know, I guess there, there could be. Mm. That I mean, that's a really good question. I I don't know if there will be like direct representation, you know, like a, a Lido ambassador on the 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 all core developers calls or something like that. Like I I don't think that makes sense to be honest. Um, it breaks the paradigm of uh the way that governance works on Ethereum too much, and I don't necessarily know that that's that's desirable either. But what is desirable is is, is like you mentioned, um, better communication and interaction between. Uh, protocols and researchers and client developers. Uh, to a certain extent, I think the existence of the LIDO protocol has already actually helped that a lot. There's node operators on the LIDO curated set that are client teams, right? The the issues that have been unearthed from a technical perspective, uh, having client teams run thousands and thousands of validators and the tunings that have resulted in, in the clients and the improvements that have been made um, in terms of like, how clients interact with MEV boost and relays and, and things like that have been really, really important. Um, the the input and the interaction that client teams and their representatives bring in governance discussions in Lido about what are no, what are mechanisms that work well for node operators in order to ensure that you know we we continue to run robust and diversified setups and we're not having a centralizing effect on on node operators. Um, like all of those things are very, very valuable. And basically, you only get that value by creating venues for these these parties to come together. Um, so, like the Lido Connect event, li like you mentioned, where it was like a half day conference, um, where we went into like a little bit of a more nuanced take on on a bunch of kind of topics around staking and, and DeFi, uh, and a bunch of other conferences in the, in this vein. You know, like the Staking Summit. I think are things that we'll see more of going forward, um, and the willingness of EF researchers and client teams to participate in like in, in these discussions, which is like very, very high, to be honest, like the, the discussions are very open of really good caliber. And even though they're like, like testy at times, I think it's for, for the best of reasons from both sides, uh, mostly because people just really believe what, like what, whatever viewpoint they're espousing. And it's not kind of like, uh, like because of animus. Um, and so I think that only good things can come from like constructive uh, engagement like that. Yeah, I guess also another big player in this is, is like sort of flashbots and MEV. Do you, how, I guess, and also like as we record this, right, in, uh, we, we have seen like other like sort of liquid staking players, very big like Jido with MEV and the liquid staking story. Now, I guess my, my question is more, yeah, how, how does Lido, I guess, engage also with MEV, is this something like um, you, like you're working with Flashbots? I guess right now most of the curated uh, validator set runs MEV boost. Now I think there's also like a bunch of changes coming 
in terms of like MEV architecture in Ethereum, but yeah, I guess in general, how is Lido approaching um, MEV? Actually, this is a, a good segue into a discussion we were having earlier about EIPs that might affect liquid staking protocols. So the two that we didn't get to talk about um, are EPBS enshrined proposal builder separation. So basically building something like MEV boost into Ethereum um, and MEV burn, which is basically like smoothing out MEV across all blocks as opposed to having very volatile rewards. Um, so like re rewinding just a little bit from those EIPs, a protocol the the size of Lido, I think, has kind of like has to take into account that a it should never play kingmaker um, with things like this. So it shouldn't necessarily like be very very specific and say we will only use one relay um, because in general you want like diversity in these kinds of things because diversity breeds um, like like excellence and, and evolution, which this and th this part of the industry really really needs. Um, so if you look at what uh, Lido DAO has done around this, there's like a block proposal rewards policy. The way that the policy was crafted was to give node operators the maximum amount of optionality possible to A, make sure that they're compliant with local laws and regulatory uh, concerns if they have any. So if, for example, they feel like they need to use filtering relays that they're able to do that. But the protocol as a whole looks at the effect that it has on the network. So. Um, Lego, which is the grants organization within within Lido, at, like a couple months after um, the merge and MEV Boost was live, and, and we were kind of looking at uh, censorship on the network, and there was kind of like a, a lot of um, concern around how much was going through relays that were quote unquote censoring. Uh, we like the the Lego commissioned a bunch of like studies, I guess if you want to call it that, or analyses about actual censorship that was happening on the network, and and then to try to use that to inform, hey, should the DAO or the protocol do more here to decrease censorship or is that at an okay level or, or should we keep continuing? So one of the things that came out of that process was that um, in the update to the block proposal rewards policy a couple months after the merge, node operators were allowed to use MinBid. Um, so MinBid is basically like a setting on on the, the in MEV boost or on the consensus layer client, if you will, because you can connect to relays directly now that allows you to say that if the bid that I get from the MEV boost network is not over a certain value, I'll just always build locally. Uh, and always building locally, basically, like if you're using stock standard clients, uh, you know, we'll just build like whatever's in the mempool ordered by priority fees. So this optionality that node operators get um, is something that actually really, really helps from a credible neutrality perspective for the network. And there's a lot of other uh, large liquid staking protocols that basically like don't take the, this approach. And then the other thing that we're looking at is, so there's like a vetting process for relays that node operators are allowed to use, but currently all relays that have applied um, have been vetted and are able to be used by node operators. So it's more like, is the relay and the team that's running the relay like technically competent? Um, can it handle you know thousands or hundreds of thousands of validators? Uh, being registered at the same time, and are there any issues with regards to like the timeliness of of blocks and things like that? And if it fulfills all of those conditions, you know, purely from an operational perspective, there's no reason not to include the relay in the in the list of relays that operators are allowed to use. The only real concern here is from a staker perspective to make sure that node operators aren't somehow engaging in MEV theft. In the curated set, it's not that much of a current concern to be honest, because like it'd be very obvious and. Um, the node operators in the curated set have a lot to lose in terms of potential future revenues and reputation. Where it gets tricky is in like the community staking module that allows for permission, permissionless entry. And so then the question becomes like, how do you monitor things like that? What are the protocols that rules that you put in place um, to combat that happening? Um, and if it happens, like how do you deal with it? You know, do you do you eject the validators using something like EIP seven zero zero two? Do you use some sort of other mechanism? So some liquid staking protocols may use like pre-signed exit messages. Basically, like node operators need to sign something and like put it in an envelope that says like open later in case of emergency where, where somebody can exit their validators. Um, or or do you come up with other mechanisms like, you know, recouping or clawing back like a portion of a, of a bond? Uh, so like all of those things are design considerations that are going into, into the CSM right now. Sorry, and to go back to your question, like, who does the Lido DAO work with here, um, or at least the contributors? And basically, like the answer is is everyone. So uh, obviously, there's a relationship with Flashbots. Uh, 
especially because like Hasu, who is um, with Flashbots, is also a strategic advisor to the Lido DAO, uh, but also because they were kind of like the, the thought leaders in the space. But we're also closely working with other relay operators um, and uh, MEV researchers as well to make sure that the tools that are being provided to node operators um, aren't ones that like harm the network ultimately, um, and also that give them the the amount of optionality that they need in order to operate uh, in in the manner that they see fit. But so this is also like I guess, do you see this changing? I, I mean, I guess you kind of touched upon it, but if it were more permissionless, potentially, I guess this optionality might mean you know less rewards for certain operators that like let's say use some filtering relay. I guess is there some force there that would like force people to like accept all relays if it's more permissionless and and is in that sense the curated set maybe like actually a good idea or like how do you how do you think about that since I guess like permissionless might mean like profit maximizing in at least in my mind somehow yeah no that's 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 a really really good question um so I, th I think what you need there is more tools to look at that like the actual effect on the network so um Tony, who like recently joined the EF doing, doing researcher like uh, Nero ETH, I think on Twitter, has this really great site called censorship.pix, um, which kind of like lets you see uh, what the actual effect of like censorship on chain through MEV boost is. And like really like the problem right now is mostly builders um, and, and less so validators and relays. Um, I think as we have more and more tools like this, that then we will empower DAOs to make more apt um, kind of like decisions and pulling like those protocol levers that we were talking about earlier in terms of what they want the protocol to look like. So if you have like a really large liquid staking protocol, uh, which in my opinion needs to enforce credible neutrality, uh, otherwise it like it's too much of a harm to the network, um, you could put in things. So for example, using like the lighter staking router that say that if a certain node operator is only using filtering relays, then there is like a maximum amount of, amount of stake that they can receive uh, and the stake goes somewhere else. So like right now that functionality doesn't exist. Um, I think it's important to build that functionality like piece by piece. First of all, you need a way to be able to reason about that on chain and to reason about it in a verifiable manner. The truth is like these mechanisms don't yet exist to take this data from off chain, bring it on chain, analyze it and utilize it on chain. It's like super laborious and super, super gas intensive or expensive basically to do this. But eventually there will be ways to do this um, like on L2s and submit proofs of the calculation back to the L1 and do something with it. Th that'll be um, like easy to do it. Uh, and so you can combine that together with additional modules like the CSM or eventually like DVT modules that are permissionless to make better staking allocation decisions between, between these modules. And you'll be able to look at node operators, not only within each module, but also across modules. So if I want to look at uh, like node operator, I don't know, I'll just say Bob, right? Um, maybe Bob has 1% of, of total stake through the curated module. And so they've they've reached their theoretical like soft cap within Lido, but they're also running a lot of permissionless no nodes. Um, maybe you want to reduce the amount of curated stake they have that to, to kind of like counterbalance that. Or you see that like Bob is actually running really, really diversified because they're like in 30 different countries and they're all in bare metal, um, and you want to diversify stake away from public cloud like uh, AWS and Google Cloud and OVH together. And so you stake, you allocate a little bit more stake to Bob until other node operators can prove that they're also running um, their infrastructure, you know, like in local data centers, and then that stake can be rebalanced away. So you create not only kind of like restrictions, but also opportunities for different types of competition um, by having robust reallocation mechanisms. Well, let's talk about restaking and eigenlayer. I mean, this is one of the the areas that's very hot at the moment, no? And uh, in the blockchain world, what? So again, maybe just briefly for those who aren't quite clued in to what restaking is, can you explain what restaking is and how do you what do you see the significance of restaking for Lido? So restaking is essentially. Um, the ability to use the same capital uh, that you've staked for for one reason uh, to stake it for something else. So when you stake 32 ETH uh, into 
a validator for Ethereum, the risk of all of that 32 ETH being like, let's say slashed right on the network is so close to zero that you're basically not optimally using that capital. Um, so you can make an, econo an economic argument that uh, some amount of this ETH, let's say four, let's say eight, let's say 16, uh, in order to have like the utmost amount of capital efficiency on it should be reutilized. You can, it's kind of like rehypothecation, but not exactly, um, should be reutilized or can be reutilized for additional rewards. Uh, and what Eigenlayer wants to do is say that, okay, um, this amount of extra ETH can be restaked for either like another blockchain or a data availability layer or some other protocol that somehow wants to secure the transactions that are happening on that network um, by utilizing the economic security properties of Ethereum in lieu of doing it themselves. Now, why would a protocol want to do this? Well, one, it saves them a lot of costs. Um, maintaining a node operator set, finding people that uh, want to run nodes and, and validate a network is actually very, very expensive. And it's like actually the largest like cost item, if you think about it, when you create a new L1 in terms of where tokens are going, because you need to have issuance and then you need to issue those tokens to node operators or validators. Um, and then the reality is if, if, if the protocol is not sustainable in the long term, they're probably just going to be selling it to recoup their costs. Um, so A, this removes downward pressure, pressure on a native token. B, it takes away the operational complexity of having to worry about these things in the first place. And C, it also creates like a cultural alignment between whatever product it is that you're creating, whether it's a network or a data availability layer um, or uh, another chain with Ethereum itself. So it, it kind of allows one to to hitch itself to like the wagon of, of Ethereum and say that, hey, we're aligned. Um, and that's really, really important from a, from a user uh, perspective. The, the difficulty uh, with restaking is that in, in, in my perspective, at least, I think that liquid staking adds, like, let's say, a multiplicative risk uh, on top of, like, the, the normal stake that you have. So if you're using it in DeFi, right, depending on how many layers deep you're going in DeFi. But restaking, I think, adds exponential risk because you can not only, like, take the restake token um, and put it in DeFi, but then you can spread it across multiple networks. And... The issue is that the collateral, which is like way at the bottom of this this giant kind of like like tower um, of of restaking, can be like leanable by a protocol that's way at the top, that has very very different let's say security guarantees, technical considerations, requirements, and thoroughness than the other different layers. Um, and the difficulty there is that it's very very difficult to actually accurately price this risk. Um, I think it's already difficult, for example, with people saying that like staking is risk-free. Like I don't think staking is risk-free. Um, and I definitely don't think that like a liquid staking token is, is risk-free either. Um, so the, the difficulty though is that like APRs all look the same. They're just like a couple of numbers uh, and they say a percentage. And then the thing is you don't know what's, what's, what's behind that number. Um, so just because something that says that gives you like 5% APR and something else gives you 5% APR, it doesn't mean that the risk of the APR is the same. And markets are very, very bad about reasoning about this this risk. Um, and the the inherent kind of like challenge with something like Eigenlayer and the the node operators that will be offering restaking rewards to to users is how to come up with this like risk adjusted rate, if you want to think about it that way, um, or risk adjusted uh, like like reward for for users. Because like one of the biggest problems we have in DeFi right now is that it's very difficult to to properly educate users about like all of the risks. Like you can write it all down on a, on an FAQ, like next to the staking widget. It doesn't mean that they'll read it. Um, and it's also like actually difficult to, to understand to a certain extent. So when we introduce additional layers, uh, it just makes it much more, more complex. That said, I think like eigenlayer in general, the mechanism design, uh, makes sense. Um, in restaking is kind of like liquid staking in the sense that it's kind of something that's going to happen regardless of whether we want it to or not, because money wants it to happen. Like capital will always find a way to do like the most optimal effect for its allocation. So the question is how, to, how, how to accomplish, uh, doing this in the, the safest way for, for users. 
Yeah, and I mean, I guess one thing one could do, right, is to say, oh, there's like, you know, 20 billion worth of ETH uh, that's backing that staked ETH, and, you know, Lido could say, oh, we, we, we are going to now use that to also secure some other things, and then we can pay, like, you know, a higher APR for this ETH. But, of course, you're absolutely right, right? You're adding a lot of complexity and risk, and, and I guess it's also seems to go kind of counter the Lido strategy, at least my understanding of Lido strategy, which has been to basically try to make the protocol pretty minimal and neutral. Right? We're also trying to address this whole thing where people are saying like, oh, but Lido's too big. Well, I think the more the more neutral it is, right, and the more uh, non-offensive, the governance minimized it is, the the less people will be upset about it. Although I guess people are still upset about the size of Lido, so I, I don't know how well that strategy is working, but uh, but it probably is working to some extent because I think if now Lido would be doing also, yeah, use that ETH to you know. Um, also secure a bunch of other speculative things happening somewhere else. Uh, I, I do think there would be a lot of backlash there, right? So I guess this whole thing of having people build that thing on top, independent of Lido, um, I, it does make sense. And that that's kind of the strategy, you know, that so Lido basically says, okay, we, we, we are staying out of this and people can build it on top. So, like, I mean, technically Lido hasn't said that because only the DAO can say things and that the DAO hasn't had a vote on this. Um, but I think that is definitely one of the, the concerns, um, or at least one of the concerns around doing it too early, because like, as you aptly pointed out, we're talking about, I mean, at current, like ETH prices in terms of USD, like 20 billion, right? So how much of that 20 billion would need to be restaked in order to have a, an appreciable effect on the rewards rate, right? Which is currently like between 3.8 to 4%, a lot of it, like probably more than, I don't know, 70 to 75%. Are there enough protocols out there that are robust enough to support, like, let's say 15 billion worth of capital being restaked into them where that's like a good bet? I mean, personally, I would say no. So until those protocols exist, um, the, the way that like Lido thinks about restaking needs to be, I believe, like compartmentalized a little bit. You can't offer it for all STE holders. Um, because you need to basically like restake almost all of STETH and that's like, that's a very, very difficult proposition right now, right? Like what exists that will give you that enough issuance in order to be able to move the needle on that. Um, and so the cool thing is that through the staking router, it might be possible to build modules where the stake that is staked into these modules is explicitly restaked. And then you can kind of create like in protocol mechanisms. Um, like tranching, for example, where you get exposure to this module, but uh, the rest of the SDE holders don't. And then like, you know, the, the, this kind of like a counterbalance in between where where the exposure is. Uh, the, the difficulty there is like prioritization. What do you want to focus on first? Do you want to focus on like restaking? Do you want to focus on like permissionless um, node operators being able to join the set and like kind of like building out the market around the staking router? Do you want to do everything at the same time? Um, I, I think the latter, like everything at the same time, isn't currently possible. It, it might be um, if, if like the contributor set grows. But right now, the the impetus and like the value alignment in, in, in terms of like what contributors have been thinking about, honestly, for the last two years is growing the node operator set, making it more decentralized, allowing anybody to be a node operator, and then um, like restaking and, and, and other stuff uh, is like a problem for like a, a little bit further down the road. So talking about prioritization, um, you know, Lido, of course, almost everyone knows, yeah, Lido Ethereum, but of course Lido has made, and, and Lido was also originally very much, you know, designed around Ethereum liquid staking. The LDO was used a lot, right, to incentivize uh, state ETH adoption, especially in the beginning. I guess uh, now I think these liquidity incentives understanding is maybe much less or I think it's almost only in STETH now um, basically it's more sustainable once you have the the rewards to give rewards in the same token as the rewards as opposed to uh, the treasury yeah yeah exactly 
But now, of course, there was uh, or there have been attempts also by Lido to expand to other networks. I mean, of course, one, we were pretty involved in the Lido Solana thing, or you kind of initially built that. So there was Lido Solana. Uh, there was uh, Polkadot. There was a whole bunch of other efforts. Um, Lido Solana, right, recently, was there was a decision to kind of close it down. I think Polkadot thing was also closed down. Uh, we had Cheeto now, which is one of the competitors uh, in uh, Solana that, uh, you know, launched uh, their own token that has, uh, you know, very high market cap. Uh, Cosmos for a long time, right? There was a lot of discussion about uh, Lido coming to Cosmos. Now we again have, I think, a, a native protocol there, Stride, that has, has done, you know, has been doing pretty well. I'm curious, what is, is, what's the thinking sort of in the Lido community around expanding to other networks? Is that still something that's um, kind of an intention or, and, and do you think it's something that Lido can succeed at? Or is it just the case that you have such a huge advantage if you have a governance token that's, you know, specific to a particular ecosystem community that can be used there? fully focused on that um, and that, you know, it's actually a hard thing for Lido to go and win in, you know, in, in these other ecosystems. That's that's a really, really great question. Um, and it's, I think it's also one that there's no clear alignment on between, like within the DAO itself and even across contributors. Um, if there was clear alignment, you would probably see more action, let's say in one direction or, or another. Um, I think the recent things that, that you've pointed out, kind of like the sunsetting of, of Polkadot and Kusama um, and Solana as well, is indicative of A, the, the realization that in order to, in order for Lido on Ethereum to become like the best version of itself, it's going to require most of contributors' attention. Um, if that attention is split across uh, like other Lido on X protocol initiatives right now, it's very difficult to have that kind of focused sense of purpose uh, and to make sure that like all of the things that are that are being said from a value and a principles perspective are are stuck to. Um, and it it also makes it very, very difficult to fight those battles if you want from a market's perspective. Like what you said is really, really apt. Every token that like natively launches on, on another chain means that it has, like its whole treasury to to fight that battle, right? Um, Lido with only one treasury, which like was funded, you know, like two bull markets ago, um, means that like if you spend it once, then like it's gone. And then uh, was it worth it in the end or not? So even though I think a multi-chain strategy from like an end state perspective, I don't know, you know, I'm talking like 10 to 15 years in the future, when it's clear that... Um, there's a couple of chains that have like withstood the test of time. Uh, and when you're thinking about capital allocation at a very large level, you know, from like an institutional perspective, they will want something like, like a basket, you know, of, of state tokens or basket of bonds, right? Like, you know, you have like, like world indices that are like treasuries from specific markets. Um, you, you will try to want to have at least like a say in all of those different uh, products. But right now, the the best strategy is is to focus on where you think you can create the most impact, um, and where you think you can create the most value. And like personally, I believe that that that's an Ethereum for Lido, right? For other protocols, like obviously Cheeto has made tremendous success um, in in Solana, and the kind of like vertical integration aspect of it has been interesting. You know, like first they came out with uh, an MEV client, and then they parlayed that into liquid staking. On Ethereum, I think it would be much more difficult to do something like that because culturally, it's like I, I don't know if something like that like that would fly. Like there there are attempts to do something like that. You know, there's like Meveth, um, but I think it's up against like much more headwinds from a from a values perspective uh, in Ethereum. Now, I was also like, I guess the interesting one here is again like sort of the restaking story, maybe where you are sort of expanding, but it's still within the Ethereum like sort of narrative or alignment type thing because it's like still using ETH. So I guess that seems to me much more aligned there or more needing to worry about that because I guess if someone stakes soul, right, it doesn't like directly attack the value proposition of, of ETH versus 
restaking where it kind of does. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And then I think that's why like STETH as a, like a base Lego um, makes a lot of sense. It's just kind of what Brian was saying earlier, right? Like if you give this optionality to users, like so Eigenlayer has supported being able to wrap uh, stake ETH into their protocol from the beginning, um, then like the protocol has done 90% of its job. The drawback there is that none of those rewards are trickling back into the protocol. Um, but from a, a usability proposition for stakers, that's like, you, you've already done 90% of, of, of what you need to do. So then the question only becomes like the other 10%, um, when is the best time to do it in order for you to get exposure to, to that value? I think there will be a time. Um, I just don't know when it is. And I think the, the restaking space needs to, like, I don't want to say mature, but like develop itself a little bit more so that some things become a little bit clearer. Um, because like, uh, like Eigenlayer is, is forging a path right now and it would be like, honestly stupid to try to compete with what Eigenlayer is doing right now. Um, because it, it would require a, a refocus of, of resources and, uh, attention that like, it doesn't make sense. Um, so a, a, as that kind of like ecosystem develops, the, what the DAO in my opinion should do is like keep an eye on it and, and see what would make sense to to integrate with and how, but also the best way to do it in, in a way that ensures that like users have the optionality and the, the access that they need, um, but doesn't sacrifice like safety or, or security of the protocol in any way. Well, one more thing I, uh, I wanted to ask about. So la liquid staking has been, I think one of the areas that has had a lot of uh, interest, right? I mean, I think Lido success is, uh, you know, the primary reason for that. And uh, and including on Ethereum, right, there's been a lot of new protocols coming. Uh, of course, none of them have had anywhere near the success of Lido, but it's clearly an area of a lot of investment and interest. I'm curious, like, how do you think about liquid staking competitors on Ethereum? And are there particular protocols or approaches that you think are interesting or like taking, you know, different approaches that, yeah, you feel like are innovative and cool or like, yeah, how do, how do you feel about sort of the competitive landscape on Ethereum? So I, I think the competitive landscape is actually pretty healthy right now. So like a lot of people are saying Lido is a monopoly and like Lido has dominance and like, to be honest, I don't think that's true. I mean, the monopoly thing is kind of like false on its on its face. If you can take the share that Lido has and multiply and find another three actors with the same share, and there's still room for them in the market, like, I don't think that makes a monopoly. Uh, and the, the second thing is like, okay, so you can have monopolies where something doesn't have like over 50 or 70% of, uh, share of something, as long as the power that is afforded to a protocol um, or a group or an entity or whatever, by virtue of having that share, allows it to do monopolistic things. And then I think, again, that argument fails. Um, so at 32%, Lido can not really do anything monopolistic. At over 33%, you know, which is the, the first technical threshold that a lot of people are are talking about, the thing that it can do is, if it's somehow, like it being the DAO, right? Um, or if the protocol itself had a way to force all node operators to like turn off their validators, which it can't, because like, um, there's no requirement for all Lido node operators to use common software, right? Uh, the other thing that it could do was stop finality on the network. And then the validators that would bear the penalties for that are the ones that would be offline. So essentially the argument is that somebody would, might pay the DAO more money than it and node operators would lose. Like even setting aside kind of like the reputational component and the future revenues component. And the fact that like some of these node operators are actually like client teams and that's not a mistake. Like there's a reason that their voices were chosen to be like part of this milieu um, to turn off the network for, I don't know, like a couple hours. Cause that's how long it's gonna last until the amount of money lost is uh, like crazy high. So that doesn't make sense. The next threshold is like 50%. So add 50%. If there was a way for somehow the light for the DAO or the protocol to enforce that enough node operators to like cross the amount of 50% to run a client that 
like accepted another fork, which is not like an, a legitimate or canonical fork of Ethereum and then change the history of Ethereum, um, that that would be bad for the network. I agree that would be terrible for the network. The reality of doing that is, well, first of all, you're not going to find enough node operators to convince to do that. Um, especially if by then, you, you know, you have additional modules and it's not just the curated set and you have permissionless node operators, which like in, in my mind, that's like a given that that's what it'll look like uh, within within a year or two. But even if you did, the threat of the user activated soft fork is there, right? So the only thing that the network would do is basically like find all of the people that were involved in this and then fork them out. Um, because like that is the ultimate defense mechanism. And that also happens at 67%. The only thing that changes there is that at 51%, if you take over the network, you will wait for some people to kind of like leak out. And then at 67%, you could slash them right away. Um, so what changes there is like how fast you would be able to execute an attack. Uh, the amount of money, like in terms of stake required to be able to execute those attacks is like, I don't know if there's any one entity in the, in the, the world that has that amount of money up unless, you know, like Powell hits print on the machine and it's just there like smacking the button every day. Um, but I, I, from a practical perspective, I just think it's also... Like, like it, it doesn't make sense. So, of course, there are, like, like that's a concern, and that doesn't mean that we should ignore it. I just think the risk from a practical perspective is really, really small. Smart contract risks, of course, it, uh, uh, exist. Um, like, malicious kind of takeover of a DAO uh, exists, and things like dual governance and an eventual ossification and stuff like that, like, those will, those are, like, the right answers to the, to the problem. It just takes time for it to happen, and, like, that's unfortunate, but... It took Ethereum like one and a half years to have withdrawals after staking. Um, it's, it took like another one and a half years to eventually potentially have triggerable exits. So being able to exit your validator from your your rewards address. Uh, and at, like to a certain extent, like protocols evolve and, and that's, that's something natural for them. Um, some don't, I guess, because they don't want to evolve anymore uh, looking at you, Bitcoin. And if that's your selling proposition, like that's okay. But Ethereum's proposition has always been that it adapts to uh, its environment and like the and where the future is, and I think it's fair to treat the protocols that live on Ethereum uh, in a similar way. Yeah, no, I, I, I yeah, I appreciate you explaining that because yeah, I think often these like scenarios is just like it's so implausible, right? Like, oh, yeah, I think, and that's the beautiful thing about proof of stake, right? It's actually like very, very resilient in a way that proof of work is not. Where like in the end, the 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 losses for someone to attack a network by like using their tokens to do something is just like so catastrophically high that we've literally never seen it. Right? There's not been a single proof of not even small proof of stake networks. You know, with like twenty million dollar market cap. Right? We've never seen something like that, and it 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 absolutely makes sense, right? Because okay, maybe it takes you then 10 million to attack this small network, but, you know, what can you gain? And then you still at risk of losing this 10 million. And, and so it's just, I think, the economics, the game theoretic properties of proof of stake, which is really fantastic. And I think that's still the case, even with Lido and even at scale. Yeah, and, and that's why something like dual governance is, is kind of great because it almost co codifies that into the, into the protocol, right? So why do you not want to attack a like a proof of stake network by buying a lot of tokens because they're going to be worth nothing after the attack, right? Either because everybody's going to leave the network or because you'll be forked out. Um, so dual governance kind of accomplishes the same thing. If I take over LDO to try to change the withdrawal address, like to my, you know, my MetaMask call wallet, um, Felix will just go start the veto process, then you'll join, then everybody else will join, you'll withdraw, and then, okay, like maybe the process takes six months and then you have enough LDO for the vote to pass, but there's zero like stake left in the protocol, so you're going to get nothing. Um, and that's that's the really cool thing about like like mechanisms like that. Cool. Well, thanks so much, Easy. It was really great to have you on. I think we covered quite a lot, and uh, and I know there's like so much going on still in Ethereum, and with all the changes coming, and a lot of going on in Lido too, right? A lot of innovation there, and a lot of great people working on it. And so, yeah, it's been it's been great to talk about it, and I'm sure there will be a uh, time for an, for another uh, lighter episode in the future where I'm sure there will be a lot of new exciting things to talk about. So, thanks so much for joining us. Th thanks for having me. And I've also seen that you're like uh, pretty involved in Urbit now. So, uh, you you ever want to talk about Urbit? Let me know. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh yeah, definitely. I may have you to talk about it. <laughs> thanks, Izzy. Thanks, guys. Cool. Well, thanks so much. Thanks to everyone for listening in. If you want to support the show, leave an iTunes review for us or just let us know what you think. Share the podcast on Twitter. And thanks so much. We look forward to being back next week.